Presenting Walter Houston in Maxwell Anderson's Valley Forge on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by E.I. DuPont de Nemours and Company of Wilmington, Delaware, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Before we begin our play tonight, we have a practical suggestion to make. If your home needs decorating, there's a quick, easy, and very inexpensive way to make it gay and cheerful again. Just paint your rooms with new DuPont Speed Easy wall finish. It's ideal for use right over old wallpaper and most other interior wall surfaces. Speed Easy is an oil paint, but you thin it with water, then apply with brush or roller. It dries within an hour, leaves a smooth, velvety surface. And it's economical, too. You can do the average room for less than $3. Be sure to get Speed Easy for your fall home decoration. It's speedy and it's easy. It's Speed Easy, made by DuPont. Tonight is the fourth in Cavalcade's new fall series of great stars in great radio plays in which Cavalcade is bringing you the finest possible in radio entertainments. The noted playwright Maxwell Anderson wrote tonight's drama, Valley Forge. And starred in the role of George Washington is Walter Houston. Next week, you'll hear Bob Hope, Jerry Colonna, and Francis Langford. The following week, Joan Fontaine. And on October 30th, Clark Gable. Now, here is your Cavalcade narrator, Walter Houston. This evening's play, Valley Forge, was written by my good friend Maxwell Anderson. Now, ordinarily, that would be sufficient introduction for Maxwell Anderson as a playwright who has captured the living spirit of America. The story of Valley Forge is one Americans are proud of, one that has been told over and over again. But today, Valley Forge has a deeper meaning. We're sharply reminded by the daily headlines that men are again fighting for freedom. Again, why must they fight once more for freedom? Against tyrants, there must be proof written in blood that free men will not be conquered. The men at Valley Forge, too, fought for it. They fought hard for it until the bullets of the enemy came crushing into their weary bodies. But they fought on. For the same reason free men fight on today. Freedom. An easy, much-used word, perhaps, but a mighty goal that knows not the meaning of surrender. The DuPont Company presents Valley Forge by Maxwell Anderson, starring your cavalcade narrator, Walter Houston, in the role of General George Washington on The Cavalcade of America. It is the winter of 1778. The place, Washington's headquarters at Valley Forge. As the play begins, Washington is speaking to a young Virginian named Alcock. How many able-bodied men in your company, Alcock? How many with guns, shoes, and equipment for a stole in the snow? Twenty-eight. Are there about, sir? Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight out of seventy-two. It'll have to do. This is a raid on Hay Island in the Susquehanna. We are informed that Sir William Howe has stored horse fodder there. We mean to get there first to salvage it for ourselves, or else dump it in the river. When are we supposed to start, sir? Tonight. Draw rations, four days for each man. We don't start tonight, then, sir. Not tonight? It's impossible, Colonel Tench. We've drawn the last rations for the regiment, such as it was. The supply was sufficient for ten days. On paper, yes. When they rolled out the last 20 barrels, the meat was spoiled. And it'll be done without meat. What a flour. Two days, sir. You'll make it do for four. As you say, sir. And good night. Yes, good night. You've much to do. Is it all tonight, Tench? That's all, General, unless you've a minute to squander on that way-faced boy you saw on the entrance. Who is he? Hanged if I know his name. I've booted him some five or six times. Let him come in. As you say, sir. Come along, man. The General will see you. Thank you, sir. Spit it out and be terse about it. I've got no time for a history. Why are you here, lad? Well, I'll say it as brief as I can, sir. The truth is, I'm dying. They tell me it's the ague or something wrong with my stomach. Colonel Tench will arrange to send you home at once. Why, thank you, sir. But that's not what I wanted. I'm afraid that's all we have to offer. It's hard to say what it is I wanted. I don't want to die. Nobody wants to die young. But I will, whether I go or stay here. General, let me die for something. Come, come, man. There's no time for this. You're in a fever. Now, one moment, Colonel Tench. Let him stay. Thank you, sir. Won't you try to see it, sir? 
A lot of men have died. I'm only one. But we're dead a long time for the want of freedom, and we came to fight for something. We believe... Don't worry, lad. We'll do what we can. You'll be looked after. Yes, sir. Good night. And his name? Yes. Uh, tell Sterling and Lafayette to come in. Yes, sir. Come in, gentlemen. It's uh, not by accident that you three are here tonight. The reports before us show that we've neither food nor clothes nor arms for the maintenance of an army. No defense if we're attacked. I have written the Congress and I have their reply. They are sending two commissioners to investigate. But by the time we've been, we've satisfied them that we're all dying, we'll muster nobody here but the sick and naked. My question simply, is the revolution over or is it worth trying to hold on? General Washington, this country had come to you with open arms. If you'd say to him once for all, I'll take just this and that and I'll take it now when it's needed. One word, one breath from you and you'd blow this Congress that's causing all the troubles from here to me. It happens that our Congress is the heart of what we fight for, good or bad, Mr. Tench. General Washington. Yes, Lafayette. May I begin by saying something you know but may have forgotten? This world you have cut from a wilderness is a new world. I find no man but looks you in the eye and says his thought in your teeth and means it. Europe has 30 kings and 100 million slaves. But the name of Washington is magical in France. You will have the help of France before the end of spring. If you knew what dreams and faith rest on you, you would do this impossible. It's impossible. As for our high purpose, we have it still. But the men, the men are mortal and die around us so fast the heaviest work is to bury the dead. If you heard of a martyr called Washington across the seas, I fear I'll disappoint you. I'd rather live and have my fun in my time before my face hardens into a mountain crag. But we have three days' supplies. We gamble our three days on a change of luck. All commanders meet here at five in the morning. Good, Good night, night, sir. Good night, sir. Oh, Lafayette. Yes, sir. Stay a moment. Yes, sir. I was short with you when you meant to praise me. I hope to be forgiven. This war is a democratic war. And one man's name... I know, sir. I... Sometimes I feel I am a difficult guest. If I'd said what I meant, I'd have told you how much you've upheld my hands when I was close to faltering. When a leader loses one battle, he senses how his world begins to slip away from him. I've lost too many since losing one. You fall across our night at Valley Forge like a young star, all flame. Let's hope you're destined to avoid our quenching. Sir, the sun is quenched in ocean and rises in the morning. I gauge my life it will be so with you. All right. Rafe? Uh, yes, sir, General Washington. Coming right out, sir. The uh, commissioners from the Congress are arriving this morning. Yes, sir. They'll be wanting a bit to eat after the journey, sir. Yes, and uh, give us the stuff that was left from the Fusiliers' dinner. I guess that stuff was worse than you know, General. The cookie couldn't pass that off on the cat. I know, I tasted it. We'll have it this morning. Well, just as you say, General. General Washington. Yes, Lafayette? I have something to report. Could you hear me? I have only a few moments. There is a message from Philadelphia. Yes, well, tell me what's in it. It may be only a trick, sir. But the congressman, sir, they're scraping their boots outside. Shall I fetch them in? That argues a certain amount of respect. Yes, uh, fetch them in by all means, Tench. I'm sorry, Lafayette, it will have to wait. If it must... Gentlemen. Well. Ah, gentlemen. <laughs> Welcome to Valley Ford. Uh, what roads? We arrive somewhat bedraggled, sir. But no less welcome for that. This is Colonel Tench, my aide, who will hear our discussions. And uh, General Lafayette. How do you do, Colonel Tench? General, we've been abroad since seven and I'm starved. We'll excuse a light collation, army fare. Surely, bring on your light collation, sir. That infernal host at the inn, we asked the man for collops and he sent us bacon. And bacon sickens me. I bet tetchy stomach traveling. Then it may be that our soldiers, father, won't do. Oh, yes, 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 it will. I'm not so tetchy by now. Then we'll be served in a moment. Uh, while we're waiting, I'd like to bring up the question of a new quartermaster. It's plain an army can't run without a quartermaster, and yet you've left me without one for three months. We know it, we know it. It's most unfortunate, but there's been some quarrel in the Congress over appointments. 
I've done my best to settle the matter, but... Uh, it's not settled yet. The Lord knows, sir, when, if ever, it will be settled. We authorized you to live off the country, General Washington. I think you'll find there's not much food within our range. And besides, if you turn men loose to ravage and steal from our own civilians... Steal? Ravage and steal? What else can you call it? No, gentlemen. Better give up at once than sow the country with thieves armed and insolent and bearing pardons signed by their officers. Now, now, a little discipline's all that's needed. Discipline? Will you show me a rule for holding an army together on air? Well, I've held together all morning on little more, and I see our breakfast approaching. A welcome diversion. Uh, here you are, gentlemen. Ah, Go ahead, gentlemen. Uh, Don't stand on ceremony. Right you are. <coughs> Good Lord. Good heavens above me. What's the matter, Mr. Folsom? Help. Help, I'm strangling. Uh, get him some water, Rafe. Uh, yes, sir. Have you tried this in the name of heaven, General? Are you ill, Congressman? Look. Look at your food. It crawls. You exaggerate, Congressman. This is better, better than what I've been having lately. Not bad at all. It moves about a trifle. Weevil's hard to kill. What is it? Mostly beans, I guess. General Washington, please. Please stop eating it. If it's as you wish. Take the plates out, Rafe. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, gentlemen. This is the mess we've dealt to several corps lately for lack of better. Is that any reason for leading hogwash on us? You're not compelled to eat it. But we are. And you sent it. Well, that is bad. I'll admit that. But give us something else to clear the air. After we've settled the question of a quartermaster for my army. General Washington, what the army needs, apparently, is not so much a new quartermaster as a new commander-in-chief. A man with a proper respect. For the Congress. Gentlemen, forget you are congressmen. Here is our war. Come down to a moldy crust. And you wrangle over ribbons. There's little stomach in Congress for further expenditures when peace is in the air. Peace? What peace? Does it surprise you? When a war is lost, the usual thing is to feel around for bargains. And that's what's being done. When did this begin? Mm, uh, no more, Folsom. Uh, it's unfortunate much has slipped. Uh, Colonel Tench... If you'll unstable our horses, I think we can make it to York by nightfall. Good day, General. Good day, gentlemen. Peace. Uh, Lafayette, your pardon for a scene hardly calculated to instill respect. It's of no matter, sir. I understood. Now you have a message from Philadelphia. Yes, but now I'm loath to speak. You're overburdened. I'll take what comes to me. Let's have it. It's from General Howe, sir. He begs you to meet and talk with him under a flag of truce. He bids you come armed with no terms save total surrender. It seems the Congress has refused my country's offer to form a military alliance with the United States. So, we've been betrayed, Lafayette. Betrayed by our own people. It may be only a trick of some sort. No, and even if it were, I believe I should come to terms with the enemy now. General Washington, you heard congressmen have approached Howe. But if peace is made, it will be on our terms. Where is the meeting to take place? On an island in the Susquehanna. Hay Island. That is where they guard the horse fodder. We plan to take it today. We won't be needing it now, Lafayette. This nation is spending its last heart's blood for a package of liberty. We opened the package today, Lafayette. And it was empty. <laughs> Listening to Valley Forge, written by Maxwell Anderson, starring Walter Houston as General Washington. Brought to you on the Cavalcade of America by E.I. DuPont, Dinamores and Company of Wilmington, Delaware. Maker of better things for better living through chemistry. In the bitter winter of 1778, General Washington, finding himself and his starving army virtually deserted, agrees to meet with General Howe on an island in the Susquehanna River to discuss terms of peace. Two of his aides, Tench and Lafayette, have preceded him. This is the place, Lafayette. It's the only barn in miles. I don't understand this firing to the south. It might be the men we sent to dump the hay. Maybe they ran into trouble. No, the hay's stored west of here. West? Well, that means... Shh, listen. Someone in that barn. Easy by the door there. Step into the light where I can see you. Who's there? Where the... Oh, I, I beg your pardon, Colonel Tench. General Lafayette. Who are you? It's all right, sir. Virginians. Virginians? I hope I'm not going to have to make you both prisoners. For what? For desertion. 
You were ordered west of here to dump General Howe's horse fodder. Yes. I came over here to lift a mess of corn for breakfast instead. We're going home. That's all. Going home? Yes. This starving down to a hide and buttons. I don't savvy. My old woman can use some ear corn. The silence in a state of truce, ma'am. You left too early to be informed, but General Washington meets with General Howe here within the hour. To sue for peace? He'd quit and sue for peace? This is officer's intelligence, man. Listen, Colonel. Truce or no truce? Deserters or no deserters? Our comrades are catching it down there. Well, if you've got a fight going on, we'll look into it. How do we get there? Follow the shoreline south. That's where you're dumping the corn? Yes. Clopton's Grand. Good enough. Wait a minute. You say the generals are coming here? Yes. What are we going to do? Lie where you are and let them step over you. Only don't shoot them when they come in. Uh, we look inside. Well, the roost inhabited by others. Who are you men? Virginian, sir. I've seen you before. Yes, sir. Valley Forge. Oh, yes. I thought Colonel Tench would be here. He was here, General, but he stepped out to mix the shindy. And you took the first opportunity to step out on your own as deserters. What do you expect a man to do? I have no doubt your circumstances might be termed extenuating. But I have a meeting here under the truce with the enemy. It would be most embarrassing to have them find me in the company of my own renegades. We understand, sir. Alcock and me will help the others get hid in the grain till you've done. We carry a flag, friend. Ours is a peaceful letter. Hey, that's them now. Hurry. Come in, come in. This is poor shelter, but it'll do for our purpose. General Washington. General Howe. I'll be brief in apologizing. Some men from my own army have descended on this island. But, uh... We'll keep the truce now. Well, General, you've had the best of this day's work. Those rascals of yours robbed the corn cribs, I'm told. However, sick transit, horse feed Monday. Does it meet with your wish that we transact our business before witnesses? Sir, I'd a little rather this discussion were known to my officers. Right. Right. And so would I. First, let it be understood that I bind myself to nothing by this meeting. Nor have I altered in my loyalty to the cause I captain. To tell the truth, and it's no secret... We're sick and sore about this war at home, and would to God it had never started, and want you back on your own terms. My own terms would mean that we never went back at all. But I'm not alone in these decisions. We have a government, and plenty in that government are sore and sick as your own, as you must know. Now, God forbid this, General. Must we take back a king? Do you think it would be for me, Sterling? Sorry to be late, General Washington. Bench, what happened? What is the fighting? I shall report in due time, sir. General Howe, in regard to certain corn which this squad of the First Virginia sacked last night, let me report it stowed on Clopton's landing. I've said goodbye to my corn, not without regret. As to the losses in this action, General Washington, there have been some wounded and some killed. How many, I don't know. But among the latter, Nick Teague... And Lucifer Tench. You list yourself among the slain? This is rather tasteless joking. I'm dead enough. My boots are full of blood. Sit down, man, before you fall. <laughs> to die for hay and grain. That's a high death for a swashing soldier. The devil take your kings and congresses in their hay. Tench. Take your hand from me. I'll walk to where I lie. A dog dies best in the corner. Bring on your burlap and the sailor's needle and sew me into sleep. I'm tired and tired. Tench, man, tench. He is done for, sir. General Howe, it may be that you'd prefer to wait elsewhere until... until we're free again. Thank you, General. I am not unmoved at any brave man's passing, but these griefs are private, and we'll take a turn outside. Come, gentlemen. These dying men have vision. Yes. This is a dark, dark morning. General Washington. General Washington. Tench. He's gone. We're all as good as dead, Lafayette. Have you pledged yourself to how? Not yet. Dead for hay and grain, he said. Sir, they... They had news at the landing. Congress has signed the French alliance. It's too late. Too late. Oh, couldn't you try, sir? I have neither government nor army, Lafayette. 
Look about you at these remnants of dying and deserting men. You chided me, sir, for speaking too well of you, saying this is a democratic war, that it must be a democratic peace. Ask them if they are ready to give in. Gather your troops and make one final effort, sir. Gather my troops. Gabriel's trumpet might rally that veil of bones. What could I offer them to follow me? Call them into me. Come in. Come in and hear me. You were some of the best, you renegades, here in the granary. There was a time when you had shoes and powder for your guns and fought to rule yourselves. Now I offer wounds and death. Winters to come, such as this you have, with our bloody trail in the snow and no end to it. If you can find within yourselves the courage and the heart to face rewards like this, to fight through the snow, the winter, and the heat of summer, in the valleys and the plains, and to the last mountain peak that we can still call free our own America. If this is what you want, then close in and take your places in my ranks. You'll take us back with you, sir? Take you back? I'll go with you. Come on, you fellows. You heard what he said. We'll go, go with you, sir. Do you mean you'll take us? We thought it was over. That's why we were going home. We thought it was falling to pieces. But if you meant what you said about being plowed under before we stop, I'm for being plowed under. Americans, what's going on here? Has my hay barn been turned into an American barracks now? Sorry, General Howe. Men, you'd better get back to camp. Yes. 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 Well, George Washington? General Howe, I am servant to those men in rags of homespun. They heard your proposition, and they refuse it flatly. The forge was cold that smelted those fellows into steel, but steel they are. This war is not mine to end, but theirs. I have my orders. You'll draw this tragedy out further? As far as we must. But you've lost, General. Lost now. They all the rules of the game were beaten and should surrender. But the spirit of earth moves over the earth like flame and stands over this, my country, like a pillar of fire to show us an uncouth clan, unread, but followers of a dream that men shall bear no burdens save of their own choosing. It's destined to win this dream, weak though we are. Sir, when I'm replaced, they'll press you harder. Sir, we engage to stand it. Very well, Ho. I'll get a drubbing at home. I bid you goodbye. General Washington. We wish you good morning and a fair voyage, General Howe. And so, we're left with some years of revolution on our hands. We have food for three days. And then for three more if we can find it. And three more if we can find it. And now, I think we will. General... What shall we do about Tench and the others? We must bury them here. They've earned the ground. Shall we fire a volley over our dead? No. We need our powder. And dead men don't hear volleys. So be it, then. This liberty will look easy by and by. When no one dies to get it. Thank you, Walter Houston. And before you return to tell us about Bob Hope's appearance on Cavalcade next Monday evening, I have an interesting story about the newest member of the constantly growing family of DuPont plastics. We call this new plastic polythene. P-O-L-Y-T-H-E-N-E. Polythene came originally from Imperial Chemical Industries, an English chemical manufacturing company, and has been under further development by DuPont for five years. Now, after extensive experimental and development work, polythene is being manufactured in the United States in commercial quantities and is available by specific allocation for war purposes. Small amounts of it are also going to manufacturers for experimental purposes. 
In the particular field in which the armed forces use it, polythene replaces other materials because of certain characteristics it has. Polythene is a remarkable plastic. The unusual combination of electrical and mechanical properties makes it particularly suitable for use in the insulation of high-frequency and high-voltage equipment. To insulate the wires, polythene can be extruded, as plastics men say, like spaghetti, so that a coating of the plastic is placed on the wire itself. In other words, polythene can be melted, and when a wire is run through the molten mass, it comes out with a polythene covering on it. Polythene remains flexible at below zero temperatures. It is unharmed by practically all chemicals and solvents. It is so light, it will float on water. At the present time, polythene is being used mainly to insulate high-frequency cables, where its low electrical losses and general physical and chemical characteristics are unequaled by any other material. Chemical research has created these DuPont plastics which serve you. Nylon plastics, lucite, methyl methacrylate resin, butacite, polyvinyl acetal resin, pyrolin, cellulose nitrate plastic, plastocele, cellulose acetate plastic. The same kind of research has now created polythene and will bring our children many things heretofore never even dreamed of things which will make for greater comfort and well-being. This is the kind of research that brings you an increasing number of DuPont better things for better living through chemistry. And now here is Walter Houston. Moments of relaxation and laughter are few and far between for the men who lies in the foxhole day and night. But there are some rare, delicious moments when G.I. Joe can laugh and forget. They come when a small band of performers, actors, actresses, comedians, singers, go out to the front lines. One man who has done much to bring these things about to G.I. Joe is Bob Hope. This summer, accompanied by Jerry Colonna and Francis Langford, he made a tour of the South Pacific battle area. Next week, on the Cavalcade of America, Bob Hope will make his first report of this trip, a report for the mothers and fathers, wives and sweethearts about their loved ones overseas. Listen next week to Bob Hope, Francis Langford, and Jerry Colonna when they bring you Report from the Pacific. Thank you. May I repeat Walter Houston's invitation to join us next Monday when you will hear their report of the men in the Pacific from Bob Hope, Francis Langford, and Jerry Colonna. In weeks to follow, you will hear other fine plays with other notable stars. Joan Fontaine will be heard in Norman Corwin's The Girl Lincoln Loved. Among others will be Charles Lawton and Clark Gable, who will make his first radio appearance since his return to civilian life. This is Fire Prevention Week. Help prevent needless destruction of life and property. All fires are preventable by forethought, adequate planning, and constant vigilance. Every fire, large or small, is a tragedy that you or your neighbor might have helped to prevent. Do your part. The musical score on tonight's Cavalcade was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. This is Gain Whitman speaking for the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by E.I. DuPont Dinamores and Company of Wilmington, Delaware, and inviting you to be with us again next week. This is the National Broadcasting Company.